Amen. Amen. If you will turn in your Bibles to the second chapter of the book of Acts. I, I want to, on our Sabbath day uh, discussions and talk and presentations, I want to uh, bring to you a, an unusual approach to the background of what all of this is about. You were born to be a worshiper of God. The reason some of you have not been, and many of us never were until we discovered his purpose, the reason we are not is because while we were born and designed to be a worshiper, we were born into a world that God never meant us to live in. God's world was the paradise of Eden. Ah, he thought so much of us that he put us in that fantastic place, our forefathers. And sin reared its ugly head and the gates of Eden were closed forever. But God had a plan to reconcile the world back to himself. <clears throat> and so, as a result of that, we are a people who have hope alive. This is a living hope today. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. In the future, I saw him right in front of me. For he's on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. These words are written as the scriptures are fulfilling those words of David. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. <clears throat> and then the heavens opened on that day when Peter preached that message, the day of Pentecost. And the Lord was before them, upon them, and in them. And he made known to them the ways of life. And, and he showed them joy and filled their countenance with it. Hallelujah. How many feel like smiling today because of the joy of the Lord? <clears throat> I want to preach a, I want to preach, I want to preach a very unusual message today. If you'll bear with me, we're going to go to school a little bit today. I want to preach on the subject, the origins of life. The origins of life. The beginnings of life. And you may be seated in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> the whole theme of this Bible and its message is simply the fact that there is a God that's interested in human life. He was the creator of life. 
And he brought us into life. How many are thankful for that? Until you know it was God that produced your life, your life makes no sense. It has no purpose. And as you get entangled in the web of sin and distancing yourself from God, you become confused. You feel empty. Every morning it's harder to get up. And every night it's a struggle to get to sleep. Tossing and turning in the night. Wondering why you were born. In fact, suicide is an epidemic cause of death in our world today because people have no reason to live. And that's because they don't know who gave them the life because in that knowledge is the purpose itself. Amen. Amen. I was not born to be an electrician, a plumber, a insurance underwriter. Uh, I was not uh, born to be a roofer. I was not born to be a dentist. I was born to be a worshiper of God. Those other things are just a means of, of sustaining life. That, that, that's, it's a necessity. We got kicked out of the perfect place where we wouldn't have had to work. And, and if you want to uh, get personal about it, just uh, look at the devil and blame him for every morning getting up early and work until your bones hurt and ache and the sweat of your brow. And uh, that's, that's where it came from. God me absolutely intends nothing for you but the best and the most wonderful. He, he's a giver of honey in the honeycomb. He's a giver of life's water. And he is the giver of sustaining bread. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. His loyalty is without end. His mercies are everlasting and they are fresh every morning. I'm talking about the real God who really loves you and he loves me. And the day you realize how much he loves you is the day your whole world will change. <clears throat> and so when you, you look back at the beginning of life, and then you look at our world today and realize that life has become cheap to so many people. Uh, there, there, is, there are some people that emerge in our world today that have no regard for life. And uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's kind of headlined by uh, abortion clinics and, uh, and people who would uh, end life uh, just... Uh, because they don't want their lifestyle messed up. And uh, uh, some, uh, you know, abortions uh, to save the life of someone, that, that's one thing, but, but just to take and placate a lifestyle, that, that's horrific. That's no better than Hitler or anything else, because those babies are the process of life, and they are the result of the giving of life that God created. It's, it's, a sacred, it's a sacred process that God set into motion so that there could be someone born that maybe looks like you, talks like you, smiles like you. And the devil, who was the original abortionist, Now, I, I'm going to stop a moment because there's a lot of people here that don't realize that there is a real devil. He's extremely sophisticated. He is invisible. God took away his power to become visible because he wreaked havoc in the world as long as he could take on some form and confuse people and, and misrepresent 
himself to people like he did in the garden. So God stripped him of his ability to come in the flesh. And so there won't be any little red suited, uh, pointy eared uh, devils with pitchforks and long tails running around. But there will be a powerful, powerful individual who will send his invading imps to perch on your shoulder and tell you how worthless, no good, and useless you are. And he does it to me as well as to you. Just because I'm up here preaching a message and I've got a decent set of clothes on, that doesn't mean that he doesn't attack me. He attacks me every day. He attacks Bishop Goder. He attacks Brother Man. He attacks all these people every day. And the, the Lord got into a hostile exchange with the Pharisees one day, and, and they were accusing him of blasphemy because they realized he was saying he was God, which he was God. So he told him, he said, I'm, I'm preaching to you the truth, and, and you reject me because I say unto you the truth. So then Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? And then this is what he said. This is what I want you to be sure you take with you today. Ye are of your father, the devil. That's what he told the Pharisees. Now that's strong language. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Not just in today's world. Where, where murder is, is just rampant and mass shootings have become commonplace. How, how many remember 40 years ago when they had a, a, a kind of a mass shooting and people were horrified? It's, we become desensitized to all of that. It's happening all the time. Murder is rampant in the world today. But he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So he's a murderer and he's a liar. The reason you have struggled with your life and had years of confusion and difficulty trying to wade through this, this world that you live in is because the devil lied to you, got you on the wrong track, had you looking for love in all the wrong places. Hallelujah. When it's just as simple as coming right here within yourself where the breath of life is and worshiping the God that gave you that breath. And returning your breath in worship and praise to Him. Yeah. Woo! That's why His presence comes down when you open your mouth and praise Him. The devil knows that. That's why he's got all these churches uh, on these street corners. You walk in and they're deathly quiet. People sit there in quietness and they never worship God even though it's called a house of worship. They don't do what the door says they do because the devil has told them you're supposed to be quiet in church. That could not be further from the truth. That's a lie. In his presence, his fullness of joy. With joy shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation. When that joy gets in you, friend, you will move. When that joy hits you, uh, you will worship. Hallelujah. And so the story of God, the, this, this life giver, he was disappointed because he lost fellowship with those ones that he created the, those first two human beings, that disappointed God. He thought he could make that work, but, but uh, the frailty and uh, 
the, the willingness uh, to be tempted and, 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 and the guile of, of, of Satan, uh, it, 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 it spoiled the whole plan. It ruined it. So God, and don't ever forget this, God began to plan a way to come back and get you and get me. The Bible says he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. It was the first little church service going on way back then. It was just the three of them. Man, a woman, and God. A man, a woman, and God. And it's the same way that way today. It's a man and God, a woman with God, or a man and woman with God. Hallelujah. It's people worshiping God one to one. You may be here in a crowd of a few hundred people, but friend, it's that dynamic one-to-one, heart-to-heart exchange that creates the dynamics of powerful worship and relationship with God. So he began, he began to plan, make his moves. and He found, as Bishop Godair said that he found a man named Abraham, and he became his friend. That delighted God. I got a friend now. I got, I got a little friend down here, me and my buddy. We're going to go out here, and we're going to get some things done. I got my buddy here now. I got Abraham. Yeah, he's he listening to me. He's listening to me. He's doing what I tell him, and boy, we're going to have a big time. I'm going to bless that man. I'm going to bless that man. I'm going to multiply his seed. I'm going to multiply blessings. And every place he puts his foot, I'm going to give him that land. I'm going to bless this man. And so he delighted in that fellowship. And, and, and so uh, time passed. And, and, and along came a, a, a shepherd that he could get to go release his people uh, from bondage out of Egypt and, and the Lord delighted in that and he said I'm going to take this a step further now I, I'm going to go ahead I'm going to set up this little tent and call it the tabernacle and I'm going to uh, somehow I'm going to arrange for these people to, to uh, make an offering or a sacrifice uh, uh, of an animal so that that blood can represent their sins because something, something's got to die because of sin and I I don't want to kill them, but death uh, comes because of sin. And uh, I, I, my mercy, I'm not going to kill those people, but I'm going to put it on that little lamb, and I'm going to put it on this little scapegoat. I'm going to put everything on these little animals, uh, and, and then we're going to cause the sins to be pushed ahead so I don't have to destroy anybody. Hallelujah. So he set that plan in motion, and then his glory would come down. His glory would come down and it would come down upon something called the mercy seat and it would lick up the blood and it would remove the sins that the high priest had put there from the, the lamb that was slain out on the altar at the beginning of the tabernacle process. And God was pleased that there was finally something going on where the people could have their sins removed for a while so there would be no destruction and judgment uh, because of the curse of sin and death. And he was pleased with that. And, and that worked for a while, but there was still that gnawing desire to be with them. And he couldn't be with them with them. It, it was like a, uh, a outside the fence with them. And there was only one man, the high priest, that could come in to that holy of holies. And that, that wasn't good enough. And he was trying to figure out how to make it better. How can I get closer? And then one day, he heard a little song wafting up from the hills of Judea. And he looked down, and there was a little boy with a harp. And he was strumming his harp, and, and he was singing a, a, some kind of a little song. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he listened to that little song, and he heard that strumming sound of the harp. And it delighted him like he'd never been delighted before. It was, a, it was an individual little teenage boy worshiping God on the side of a hill amongst his little sheep. And he looked down at that and he said, I want more of that. Hallelujah. And then he heard him burst into another song. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. Oh, he said, that's it. That's it. 
I want that. That's a man after my own heart. One of these days, I'm going to get a whole bunch of people just like that little boy, and I'm going to raise them up to worship me. That's, that's what's going to happen. Oh, I got it now. Woo! I got it now. And, and so, so he began to uh, talk about things, and he began to plan something he, he called a, 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 new, a new way and a new covenant, shall I say. And this is what he said uh, through the prophet Isaiah. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever." That's my covenant. I'm putting my words in your mouth. And that's going to be my covenant. I'm going to give you the words to praise me with. I'm going to give you the words to declare my glory. And this is going to be my covenant. I'm going to figure out a way how to get it on the inside of you. Hallelujah. And so the... Prophecy followed up with that for, with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye shall cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Upon all flesh. I'm just going to come down and be with them in their living room. Yeah. Hallelujah. God excited God. And the human beings involved. Isaiah who wrote some of those words didn't even know what he was talking about. Prophet Joel, he didn't know what he was saying. He was just doing what the Lord told him. He had no idea that that was a future vision of the day of Pentecost that was going to come to pass where God was going to create a covenant and put the worship on the inside. Hallelujah. Put the worship in their mouths. Hallelujah. With stammering lips, he would put it there. He would pour out his spirit and that spirit would come down, baptize them, fill them, flow through them, saturate them, permeate them, and cause them to burst forth with a sound like had never been heard before. And that would be the new covenant. That would be the new covenant. In 1959, Dr. Henry Van Dusen, president of Union Theological Seminary, made this statement. He said, there are four forces of religion today. And he mentioned Christianity. He mentioned Islam. He mentioned uh, the Jewish religion. And he said, the fourth force is Pentecostalism. Today, right now, approaching 900 million, just shy of a billion people, or a number of people throughout the world that have experienced the outpouring of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. Many of them do not know the full truth, but God is pouring out His Spirit wherever there's a prayer meeting, Wherever there's desire, wherever there's a Bible study, wherever there's an open heart, a hungry heart, because all that's required is a thirsty, hungry heart. And God will come and do the rest. It's that God that was disappointed from the beginning coming to you and I. And when that fills you, Ladies and gentlemen, it will transform you in a way you never knew you could be transformed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to take you on a little trip with me. And I'm, I'm going to show you something in the Word of God that is so deep and so profound. And, and it spans the ages of time. 
It connects the old with the new. Connects the plan of God in the ancient of days to the modern world today. And I'm going to begin it with uh, myself as a fourth year student, University of Indianapolis, winding up my uh, years at college to get my bachelor's degree. I had planned on being a teacher, and I was looking for an elective to fill out my curriculum selection of subjects for uh, the final semester, and I was looking through the list of electives, and I found something that looked interesting. It said the history of the English language. And I looked at that, and I thought, well, that's kind of, uh, that's different. I, th I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign up for that. So I did. I did, and I went in uh, on the first day of the course, and uh, there I heard the professor, Professor Waller, uh, she got up and began to hand out books called The Roots of Modern English. And, and she began to talk about some things that uh, I'd never heard before. She said that uh, <clears throat> a group of linguisticians or people who study language uh, had embarked on a 20-year uh, period of time to study languages and their purpose was to find out how language originated in the history of the world, where it came from, who started it, and they had set out on this course. There were several of them on the team. They started in the 50s, and they had just concluded this study uh, just a year before uh, we were uh, I had signed up for this course, and they had published this book. And so she uh, passed the book out to each of us and began to write uh, on the screen, and she wrote uh, some amazing statements. She said, these uh, students of language, these uh, professional researchers have traveled to Rome They've traveled to London. They've traveled to the ancient libraries of Egypt. They've explored bookstores. They've explored libraries. They've explored all over the world and, and, and traveled many thousands of miles and said they've accumulated a lot of information, but said they finally wound up with an inescapable conclusion. And, and that was they have no idea where language began. They said they can find where some of the first languages were used, but, but they can't find where it began. And they've looked, and they've looked, and they've looked, and they, they can't find it. And said the final conclusion was, we just can't pinpoint where it began. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, she, she kept on talking and said, not only that, but she said uh, uh, they discovered uh, that man in his present state of intellect, and this was in 1973, uh, man in his present state of intellect could not create his own language. And she said, you know, this is really amazing because we just assumed that you know, we all developed our own languages. And she said, they said, language is far too complex for a human mind to just create. Said nobody, no group of people, no single individual, no matter how brilliant they were, can create their own language. And so she said, since we are studying the English language in this case, she said, I will show you the three steps it would take to start an English language. And so we, she said, turn to page such and such in the book, and we opened the book, and she began to describe what it would cause, uh, what it would take to actually create the English language. And the first step would be to create what was known as a phonic alphabet. And that's an alphabet of sounds. Ah, b, c, d, d, k, b and all the phonics that go along with our language. And said so they'd, they'd have to create uh, uh, literally uh, hundreds of these sounds 
to begin with, so it would work to form the language. He said the second step would be to put those uh, sounds into some very, very elementary, basic uh, words like hello or goodbye. And, and she said, this, this is very complicated. So I got, to, I got to thinking about all those phonic sounds and, and, uh, and I remember the sound I made when I first looked at my wife and realized she was the one. And that gorgeous, that gorgeous creature was standing there in front of me. And I went, oh. I was at the very beginning stages of language. Oh. And when she looked and smiled back, I said, Ah. And when your mother-in-law comes to visit, you go, ow. <laughs> See, we're still doing that. <laughs> and the, these, these utterances, these, these sounds were to create something that would go on to create something far more complex. And so she said that it would make up and uh, something, these words, these first elementary words were called morphemes and, and they were forms of sound put together just for the very sake of, of beginning to have something to use when you see somebody. Now, wouldn't it be hard today if all we had was the phonic alphabet and you're trying to uh, do a computer with nothing but the phonic alphabet. You're trying to work on a computer. You're trying to talk uh, in a courtroom. You're trying to talk medical uh, language to students in a medical university with ooh, ah, ee, ah, ah, bing, bang, wada, wada, bing, bang. <laughs> we, we wouldn't be anywhere. And so, and so she went on to describe that the third step in creating the language would be to create the syntax or the categories of grammar, which involves nouns and pronouns and prepositions and adverbs and verbs and, and all kinds of different ways to, to create a, 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 a category of using those words uh, to show activity or to show identification uh, uh, to show objects and, and uh, behavior and so forth. And she said, uh, th the problem with all of this is that, that man could never, ever get past the first step of the phonic alphabet. He said, no matter how brilliant it is, he just couldn't do it. And said, said he couldn't, of course, get past the second either. And said, the third is out of the question. said, it would be 10 million to one that a person or an individual could create their own language. And she said, the, this is why they have said that man could not create his own language. It, it could not have come. This is what she said. They said it could not have come from anything in this world. Oh, when she said that, oh, my ears immediately tuned in. And, uh, and so she said, well, that's all we have time for today. She said, as you leave the class, if you'll please uh, put down uh, on a piece of paper the uh, subject for your term paper for the class. As you leave, she had given us uh, a, a form to fill out for our term paper for the course. And, and, uh, and she wanted us to, you know, put down what we were going to try to do in the way of a term paper. So uh, I waited till everybody else left, and I took my form and I filled it out, and uh, I walked out, and I said, here, professor, and, and she looked at it, and she said, well, this says that you know where language came from. I said, that's exactly right, ma'am. Well, she said, sir, if you know that, you have really, really accomplished something that nobody else can. I said, well, it's not me. I just said, somebody far greater from me, and it's somebody from outside this world. She said, what are you talking about? 
she said, if, if you're going to take on something of this size and this, you know, this uh, magnitude, she said, I'm going to need to take you to the library and we're going to have to go looking through some books and give you some starter material. I said, no, I have my book. I said, I have my book. So I went ahead and walked down to the library with her, and I said, look, just sit down there on that stool, Professor Waller. I said, I, I, I want to I wanna show you something. And I began to look at the Word of God, and I took her to Psalms 8. And I said, I want to show you something. I said, there is in the writings of, of the Word of God, which is inspired by God. I said, the inspiration of God caused these writings to be written and I said, it explains just how things happen that, that you and I are now talking about right here today. And I said, listen to this from Psalms 8. Uh, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And yet you have crowned him with glory and honor. I said that crown of glory and honor is the ability for a human being to have comprehension, to have cognition, to have reason and rationale. I said it's a, it's a crown that separates him from the rest of of the creature world in the seas and the oceans and the world. I said, you're higher than the animal world. He gave you dominion over them. He gave you the ability to speak, to think, to talk. I said, God did this. Hallelujah. I said, we have that crown, that crown of glory, of intellect that God put in us. And while I'm talking to her, the Holy Ghost shined its light into my mind and said, listen to what you're saying. And I thought, within myself, I thought, okay, Lord, what am I saying? And the Lord just began to pour those words into my mind. He said, I want you to look back at the second chapter of the book of Genesis. And I said, the Bible says, uh, and so I started telling the professor this. Uh, I said, I have a little inspiration right now. I said, the Bible says that when God took the first human being and carved him out of the dirt and held him in his hand and breathed into his lifeless form the breath of life, that man became a living soul. <coughs> I said, man became a living soul. And I said, that living soul opened its eyes and began to move its arms and began to move its legs. It was dead. It was inanimate. It was lifeless. It was a form, a forlorn form. But God breathed into it. That breath. That breath ignited the neurological impulses in his nervous system. It started the heart to beating. It started the lungs to breathing. It caused there to be life. Hallelujah. It caused the amazing, miraculous process of life and the living of a human being and creature. <coughs> Now, I'm going to tell you what. The Lord kept talking. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Now, listen to this, Sonny. He said, Listen to this. There's only two places in the Bible where God breathed upon man. Where God breathed upon man. The first time was in the garden when God breathed on Adam. And Adam stood up, began to walk, and began to talk. He was not, listen to this, he was a created creature at that point. He was a created human being that had never been anything like him before. 
He didn't have to go to school for his language. He didn't have to go through phonic alphabets. He didn't have to go through morphemes. He didn't have to go through the syntax. When God breathed into his life, he immediately began to talk. And I said, the Bible says he put him in the garden. He began to name the animals and the trees and all the things, the living things. Mm. Man, this guy was an absolutely intellectual creature right from the beginning. He saw a, a, a kind of a, a big gigantic thing busting through the jungle. Uh, and he looked over and he said, elephant he saw some little creature scurrying across the path he said armadillo he had saw another creature out in the river that was causing a big wake in the river he said hippopotamus and he began to name everything he began to talk he began to communicate he began to worship God I said the second place in the Bible where God breathed on humanity was the second chapter of the book of Acts. And the Bible says when the Holy Ghost fell on them, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Oh, hallelujah. Friend, when you begin to talk in that heavenly language, it separates you from that world of sin and that animal behavior you were caught up in. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I'm talking about a divine act of God here. There are so many people when the day of Pentecost happened and also when Azusa Street happened when the Holy Ghost was first poured out there are critics and there are enemies of it and there are opponents of it and they look at it and they look at speaking in tongues and they say oh that, that's just something that happened back then and it was just to uh, kind of be an interpretive uh, device for uh, Peter as he preached oh no you've got the whole thing wrong it's not some little small little insignificant something uh, it's not some little generic gift of the spirit uh, that just pops up once in a while to a few individuals uh, it is the very foundation of life itself it's when God has baptized you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet uh, with a new creation with a new creation with a new beginning and he baptizes your soul puts inside of it a sound and an utterance uh, that you could never manufacture on your own oh hallelujah Hallelujah. I'm talking about something that every one of you is a pattern of. When you came out of your mother's womb, when you came out of your mother's womb, the doctor took you out, uh, or the nurse, or whoever was attending you, uh, they brought you out, uh, and they were waiting to hear something. The baby was just kind of laying there in their arms, but they were waiting for here something. They were saying to the baby, baby, cry. Baby, cry. Let me hear your voice, baby. Cry, baby. And, uh, the sound of life is the cry of the uh, newborn. That's the sound of life. That's the beginning of life. Hallelujah. That's the sound of life. That's the very beginning of the existing creature itself. And when that baby finally opened its mouth and cried they knew that the birth was complete and that life had begun individually for that child that's how you got your beginning in a natural world it's the same thing in the supernatural kingdom of God. You come to this altar, you raise your hands, you open your mouth, and we're looking down saying, come on, baby, let me hear your voice. Let me hear you cry. <laughs> Woo! Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Let me hear the sound of your life, baby. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye shall cause the weary to rest. It's time for you to quit fighting sin, fighting yourself, fighting the devils of hell, and release yourself into the glorious breath of life that only God can give. I want you to use that breath to praise him right now. God gave you that breath. God gave you that life. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Woo! Oh, let's stand in his presence today. Hallelujah. Man, I'm telling you, the power of God is in this place. There is a powerful well springing up right now. Hmm. As our musicians come today, there's a, there's a reason why... Traditional and denominational churches tell you you don't have to speak with tongues to be saved like those Pentecostals say. There's a reason for that. Because the abortionist has wound himself into their theology. And they'll tell you everything about God up until Calvary. They'll talk to you about going to Calvary, praying a prayer, seeking God, but they will never tell you what Jesus himself said. Go, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. I, I'm going to be real plain today. The assembly of God denomination has de-emphasized speaking in tongues. A lot of charismatic groups have said, well, we don't know if it's important anymore. It's not theirs to say. It is written. This is my covenant. I will put my words in your mouth for your seed, your seed, seed forevermore. This is my covenant. Get out of my way, religious tradition. Get out of my way, theological ineffectiveness. Get out of my way, false doctrine. I'm going to the throne. I'm going to the life giver. He's been after me. He's been seeking for me since the Garden of Eden. He's been looking for me. He wants to dwell within me. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you, but I shall be in you. Since this new year started, people have been in this altar hungry. They'll be here again tonight. Hungry. People seeking the power of God. Hungry. He that thirst after righteousness and hungereth after righteousness shall be filled. 
you shall be filled. Don't listen to what professional religionists say. You shall be filled. If you're hungry and you're thirsty, my covenant is I will put my words in your mouth. I want people that really, you're serious about God in filling you. I want you to reach out to him right now. You've already done it in the service earlier. That was an appetizer. That was a precursor. I want you to take somebody by the hand and bring them to this altar. I want you to come with the idea that there's a God that wants to be in you and with you more than you want to be with Him. He's so desirous to be restored into your fellowship. Hallelujah. 2023 is going to be different for you. My sweet soul, my dear friend. You are a friend in worship. We've come to worship God in this place. I want you to start this year off with a baptism of fire. Oh, hallelujah. That's it. That's it wherever you're at. Lift your hands. All over this place. Christ, by the remission of sins, 